All right, ladies and gentlemen, Rangers lead the way. This is take two of Ambush Part 2. The first one did not record any audio, so we are redoing it. Um, we'll just briefly go back over uh, hasty ambush and different types of ambushes real quick just to brush everyone back up so you don't have to go back and rewatch the first ambush video. So again, an ambush is a surprise attack from a concealed position on a moving or temporarily halted target. So you've got two types, hasty and deliberate. Hasty we covered last time. Hasty is more of a battle drill. It's something that you need to rehearse as a unit if you're going to actually uh, do it out in the field or out on uh, out on patrol. Uh, you can't really just expect people to know how to set up a hasty ambush unless you drill it like you would any of the other battle drills, like battle drill one alpha, squad attack, or knock out a bunker, any of those. It really should be its own battle drill. Um, do not attempt to do a hasty ambush if you have not rehearsed it because it's probably going to end up going poorly for you. And then you have deliberate ambush, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So you've got point, area, near, and far. Again, point is just one, one specific kill zone on one part of the road. And then you have area, which is multiple point ambushes spread out along our, an enemy's planned or templated route of travel. You have near, which is typically within hand grenade. Official army doctrine says near ambushes are 50 meters or less, so it's a little bit outside of hand grenade range. And then you have far, which is outside of you know hand grenade range or outside of 50 meters. You've got your linear, you've got your L shape, and you've got your V, your Z, and your Y, which if you want to know what those are, go back and watch part one. All right. We're going to talk deliberate ambush today. So task, initiate a surprise attack on a temporarily halted or moving target. Conditions, given a squad or larger size element with belt feds, explosives, or anti-tank weapons. The standard, an ambush is in place no later than time specified during planning or according to the order. The patrol surprises the enemy and engages the main body in the kill zone. The patrol kills or captures all enemy in the kill zone and destroys equipment based on commander's intent, intent of the ambush and the patrol initiates a planned withdrawal to the from the ambush site to the ORP and then conducts follow-on operations after they get 100% on MWE. So some key factors when you're, when you're setting up and planning for a deliberate ambush. You need to be able to cover the entire kill zone with interlocking fires. You need to have existing or reinforced existing obstacles to keep the enemy in the kill zone. Security teams need to be armed with handheld anti-tank weapons, claymores, and means of communication with the PL ambush or the ambush leader, rather. Uh, obviously, if you're civilian and planning and conducting ambushes, you might not have access to anti-tank weapons. Um, but the minimum thing you're going to have to have is means of communication with the main ambush body because you are the early warning system for the ambush. And then the timing of all of the elements of this ambush they have to be done in a way to avoid losing the element of surprise. Um, and at any point during the ambush, if the uh, someone is compromised, they are able to initiate the ambush on their own. And then lastly, if an ambush has to be manned for a long period of time, you only use one squad to man the ambush line and then rotate the other squads through the other positions. So rotate them through security, rotate them through the ORP so they get some rest, etc. Again, this can only be done at the platoon size level. If it's a squad size ambush, it's going to be a little bit harder and you're going to need to plan uh, your actions on and your actual time of the ambush a little bit better. So we'll talk site selection here. So as far as it can be helped, you should try to avoid using perfect ambush sites because the enemy is going to be just as well versed in ambushes as you are. You have to assume that, right? So any point on a route where it's like, obvious from just map reconnaissance that like, hey, this is a perfect L shape in this canyon or this valley or whatever. Like this would be a perfect spot to put up an ambush. Like the enemy is going to realize that too. And they're going to be on higher alert going through these obvious ambush sites. Unless they're, you know, kind of an inexperienced convoy or in the earliest stages of a conflict before counter ambush TTPs can be effectively uh, spread out and taught to the entire force. So a good ambush site should have, again, a good field of fire to the kill zone, good cover and concealment for the assault and support, have protective obstacles, a covered and concealed withdrawal route, and it should be difficult for the enemy to conduct a flank attack. So if you can pick terrain that's you know high ground uh, above the kill zone, that's always a, a really good 
uh, location to set up your ambush line is on higher ground than the enemy. So the kill zone needs to make it so that the enemy is likely to actually enter the kill zone. It needs to have natural tactical obstacles, and it should be large enough to observe as well as effectively engage the anticipated enemy force. So prepping for the ambush, all of these are all these preparations are made in the ORP. So go back and watch the ORP video if you haven't. Uh, Rangers are individual. On the individual level, you're going to reapply camo, silence any equipment, top off magazines, and then you're also going to prep any kind of special equipment. So claymores, your t &E for your guns, so tripods, round bags, extra barrels, and then again, crossload ammunition as needed. Make sure radio batteries are good to go. All of that. Make sure you take a piss or a shit if you need to, because um, you're not going to be able to do that on the ambush line. So in the ORP, while everyone's kind of prepping this, the leader's recon is going to get ready to go. So it typically is going to include all of your squad leaders. So assault one, assault two, weapon squad leader, and your security squad leader. I'm going to take a surveillance team from an assault squad, which will be a saw gunner or grenadier, saw gunner and a grenadier or rifleman, the forward observer, and potentially the entirety of security squad. Again, we'll, we'll talk about this here in a bit. Um, but one of the options is to emplace security during the leader's recon so that they have, you know, at least like the ambush site kind of isolated and they're able to get eyes on the road and act again as a, as a further early warning system for the ambush line. Um, the platoon leader is going to give the gotwa to the platoon sergeant and then the PL is going to start moving the recon party to the possible ambush site. The first thing he's going to do is get eyes on the actual ambush site. He's going to identify the kill zone. He's going to make sure it's suitable, make sure the terrain is, is good enough for the ambush, make sure that they have cover and concealment. That's like the first kind of step that he's looking for. And then once at least that's good, he's going to emplace the security or the surveillance team rather, and he's going to give them a contingency plan as well. So we have our graphics for today. We have a road here. We have our ORP again, one to 200 meters at night, two to 400 meters during the day. And our templated direction of enemy travel or enemy movement is going to be west to east on this road. All right, so our leader's recon is out. And in this scenario that we're kind of talking over and templating here, we are going to take the entirety of security squad here. So we have our leader's recon body, our surveillance observation team, and then our two teams of security. And they're going to stay back. They're not going to follow the PL around the objective. Um, so we've identified kill zone here. Next thing he's going to do is he's, the PL is going to confirm the suitability of the assault position. So they're going to make sure he has got cover and concealment, clear lines of fire into the kill zone, and cleared lanes to actually get up from their places of cover to assault through the kill zone. And he's going to designate far left and right limits. Next thing he's going to do is he's going to confirm the support by fire position, and he's going to give them and in place sector stakes uh, to give them right and left limits to make sure that they don't, those machine guns don't fire into the assault line. This is going to be a L-shaped ambush if you couldn't figure that out already. And then he's going to identify all the other possible offensive control measures to be used, which will include a probable line of departure, which is a line back from the actual assault positions where the squads are going to get online and IMT or low crawl, high crawl into their actual ambush positions. Um, and then the LOA potentially on the other side of the kill zone. The PL is going to confirm the security positions and make sure that they do not mask the fires at the main body so that they're not going to be directly in line with, you know, like the support by fire or anything like that. And place in a way that they're able to actually give timely information to the main body. You know, you don't want them just, you know, 25 meters away from your assault line because the assault line is going to be able to see the, the freaking enemy at the same time security does. So you want them decent ways out. So 75 to 100 meters away, I don't think there's actual any specific doctrine on how far they should be. It's kind of a uh, MET-TC situation. And they need to be able to provide a support by fire position if needed, um, if enemy approaches during the action zone. And then the PL is also going to identify a release point, RP, where this is where everyone's going to kind of go first. It's in between the actual objective and the ORP. And everyone's going to go to the RP and individually 
um, by element they're going to go and, and actually in place on the ambush line. So leaders recon is surveilling and uh, making sure that that support by fire location is good. He's got right and left limits in the kill zone here to make sure that uh, the actual assault line template assault line would be right where SNO is. And he's making sure that they're good. He's in place security already. Um, and security does not mask any of the fires from the assault or the support locations. And then he's going to, you know, adjust the plan based on info from the recon. He might only need only have room for one squad potentially. And then that other squad might be held in reserve or pull rear security or, or P security. But in this case, it's big enough. We're going to use both assault squads. Uh, and then that ambush site is confirmed once he's he's confirmed all three of those different positions so security assault and the support by fire so if the security squad accompanied the pl on this recon he's gonna return to where they were kind of hanging out and waiting and he's gonna emplace them um, either by himself like actually leading them into their security positions or he's gonna give instructions to the security squad leader and the security alpha team leader on where they need to go and take their uh, take their teams. And again, security has to be in place prior to in placing assault and support. You need to isolate the objective first, and then you need to set, I guess, almost containment, if you will, with the support by fire. And then you have your uh, assault elements, obviously. And one thing you're not going to do is man the ambush line until the last possible minute where it makes sense to to in place before or without getting compromised rather so you know if you got to the orp way ahead of schedule you you could do that leader's recon right away and then take the time to refine the plan and then not in place too early so that you don't have the problem of dudes falling asleep on the ambush line all right so we've templated the loa we've got security in place we have the leader's recon Returning to the ORP, we have our RP, our release point established, and we're leaving a, a surveillance and observation team as well. One thing that I will say that's important to do, um, this is most kind of a ranger schoolism, but it also really applies to real life as well, is using the cloverleaf method for reconnaissance, right? So when you're surveilling an ambush site, like, yeah, there's not going to be anyone there, but you don't, you don't know that. There might be some kind of enemy reconnaissance team as well. So that PL and those squad leaders are going to use a technique called clover leafing to observe and recon, recon the kill zone, the whole objective area. So what that is, is watch my mouse here. So the, the PL is going to want to approach head on to the kill zone. He's going to want to do his reconnaissance, his observation there. And then he's going to come back out the same way he came in. He's not going to parallel the objective. Uh, the human eye is able to track left to right motion a lot easier than straight forward and straight back. Uh, there's a lot of reasons behind this, um, but that's just one way to maintain stealth during a reconnaissance. So he's going to cloverleaf around. He's not going to just oh, beep up and parallel the road here because if there is anyone watching, they're going to be able to pick that up a lot easier. Um, and he's going to probably low crawl the whole time. Or at least, at least the, on the approach to the uh, to the kill zone and stuff, like he might be able to to pop up and and walk once he's back from it and you know back in the woods or whatever. But that is something that our eyes do grade for in Ranger School is did the PL parallel the objective or not? And you can fail your entire leader recon or leader recon if you can if you do that. So just something to keep in mind. Moving on. All right, so we'll talk occupation. So. One thing you are going to have is an ORP security team, which is generally going to be like just two dudes, um, two riflemen from one of the assault squads. And they're going to sit there and they're going to guard the rucksacks and be ready to count people in after the ambush is over. So in some cases, you might not leave people in the ORP or you might not even have an ORP and you're going to take your rucksacks with you, in which case uh, you'll have to designate a rear security team and we'll have to have some kind of rucksack plan at the release point or something. So once you've got your ORP team and given them a contingency plan, so Gatwa, the rest of the platoon is going to pick up and move towards the ORP, or rather the RP, or they're going to hold fast in the ORP depending on the PL and the situation. 
So the PL is going to, regardless of where they're coming from, either the RP or the ORP, the PL is going to take the support by fire or the support and take them one element at a time. So the order of movement is going to look like the PL. He's going to take support in place support. He's going to take the assault, either both assault squads or just one assault squad at a time and in place them. Support is going to move again to their designated position. And at this point, the weapon squad leader is going to take over uh, after the PL. The weasel will probably walk him in because he knows where it is because he was on the leader's recon. But he's going to make sure that the sectors of fire are assigned and then the tripods are set up with metal to metal contact to prevent fratricide. They'll emplace claymores if they get told they need to emplace claymores. Um, potentially only used on linear ambushes. Uh, generally, you're not going to want to use those on L-shape because the claymores kind of blow out at angles. So it'll it'll be a little harder to ensure there isn't fratricide on the assault. Um, so metal and metal we'll talk about here in a second. So we've got our assault one, assault two, support by fire, and support by fire gets set up first. They're all ready to go. So this is a, don't remember the nomenclature, but this is the current tripod. In the tripod you'll be using in ranger school so you've got your your e mechanism here and there's a way to adjust the legs and this whole contraption to where when you go all the way to one direction it's not going to point the gun at your assault location basically um, it's kind of hard to show here with just a picture um, but that's what that metal to metal means it means when you're all the way in one direction like that gun can't go any further left or right. All right. So once support is in place, the assault's going to move into position and they're going to move in formation to the probable line of departure. And then they're going to spread out online and move the rest of the way to the ambush position. So depending on time, you could either place both assault squads at the same time or one at a time to just kind of reduce the amount of movement in and around the objective. And you're going to want to probably low crawl up to your position from the probable line of departure, low crawl or high crawl. And the squad leader is going to make sure that each member understands the kill zone and they're going to assign right and left limits. And then a couple dudes from assault are going to go in and place the claymores and ensure those are in place correctly and camouflaged. All right. So we've got everyone set. We've got our assault one, assault two. We've got our claymores. The graphics are kind of got wonky uh, exporting them in Canva. Uh, tried to fix it a bunch, but they came out kind of looking like ass. Anyways, those are claymores. <laughs> and now we're just playing the waiting game. So it's it's critical that the ambush line maintains discipline and stays awake while they're waiting to actually kick off this ambush. Um, in Ranger School, it's hard because, you know, you're sleepy. Uh, in my first Florida, it was my second look. I was an assault squad leader. I want to say... I was, shit, what was I? I? I take it back. I was a security squad leader for this one. But we went to the wrong ambush site initially uh, because the RIs gave us two conflicting pieces of, of intel for the planning. So we walked to one ambush site and the RIs are like, hey, this isn't it. Like, what are you guys doing? And then we walked. We had to walk and hurry back to the other objective site, hastily set in an ORP, hastily do a leader's recon and it was an absolute shit show and while we were in place and waiting for to kick the ambush off everyone fell asleep every single member of the assault line and security at least on the far side that the enemy was coming from everyone fucking racked out uh and it was a bad night so that's the you know best cases that happens in ranger school in real life you know that could end up being your entire patrol or platoons fucking lives because you guys didn't stay awake on the ambush line. So, all right. So the good news is Intel didn't completely fuck it up and we have an actual ambush coming. So we, our security, far side security or near side security spots the enemy and they give the PL the warning. They're going to tell them size, direction, equipment, uh, and then, then keep an eye out, keep an eye on and an out for, any other forces following the main body. So they might send, it might just be like a two, two vehicle, like kind of, what's the word for it? You know, like scout force, if you will, like a, like an initial, just couple of vehicles driving down the road to spot for a larger convoy or main body and to act as a kind of 
bait for ambushes. So the PL, if, you know, he deems it like from the information that he gets from security, if he deems like, hey, we can take this on, he's going to make sure that everyone's alert and he's going to make that decision. So in this case, we've got three gun trucks. PL deems that, hey, we can take those on. And he's going to decide to initiate the ambush. The PL is going to initiate with a casually producing device, ideally the highest casually producing device they've got. So either the Claymores, an AT4, uh, either and then or radioing to the support by fire, hey, kick it off. And worst comes to worst, he's going to use his own weapon. And you want to use a casually producing device because you don't want to start out with like a freaking, you know, smoke grenade. And that's going to give the enemy enough time to potentially react. So you want to start with a casually producing weapon. So the squad leaders and the PL are going to ensure that the support and assault deliver fire with the heaviest, most accurate volume possible in the kill zone during that mad minute. And you're going to be firing at a rapid to a cyclic rate of fire. After that mad minute, the PL is going to call a ceasefire and they're going to wait to see if the kill zone is silent and or neutralized. If not, you're going to repeat the mad minute uh, until it is. So boom, we initiated with Claymore in this situation. Support by fire starts ripping. The assault squads start ripping. And we're uh, getting to the business here. After that mad minute, the PL is going to make sure that support by fire has lifted fire prior to assaulting through. And assaulting through needs to be pretty much immediate after you hit that ceasefire to uh, not give the enemy time to react to uh, this, uh, the rest of the attack here. And the assault is going to either bound by teams or use IMT through the kill zone. So it could be, you know, squad one, assault one bounds through and assault two bounds through. And they're going to kill or capture any enemy. And then they're going to establish that limit of advance outside of hand grenade range. Reestablish chain of command, reassign key weapon system. Uh, you're going to load a fresh magazine or a drum using the buddy team method. And then the TLs are going to start going to work and gathering lace reports and pushing those to the squad leader. Squad leader is going to push lace reports to the PL. All right, so bounding through, we've got our, our LOA here. All right, post-assault procedures. So PL is going to call for special teams, and these teams are going to come from the assault squad. So generally for your EPW and search teams, it's going to be about four dudes. Uh, aid and litter teams will initially just be two if needed, um, potential to expand to more. And then demo team is going to be one or two dudes. So he's going to give them clear task conditions and standards to the special teams. And he's making sure that the, they, they move their ass and there's not too many dudes on the objective at one time. So first things first, any EPWs are going to be taken off the objective before it's searched. So if there's anyone left alive, you can't just fucking go back and kill them legally. Uh, you have to pull them off and, and begin to render aid. Um, but search teams are going to use, utilize the clear out searching method. So they're going to, those two teams of two are going to start in the middle of the objective and they're going to split and clear all the way down, making sure that there's no one, you know, no one alive that they didn't find initially. And they're going to be clearing the bodies, make sure no one's lying on any grenades. Um, we'll talk about that probably in its own designated video, but you're going to use a two man, uh, clear technique where one dude is going to roll the body over the other dude's going to check it. And if there is a grenade, he's going to roll that body back over and they're both going to get away from that grenade. So, yeah, just moving on. So what you're looking for now, so you clear out and then you start searching the bodies on the way back into the center of the objective, right? And so you're looking for identifying insignia, ID cards, weapons, maps, any kind of overlays, documents, radios, cell phones. And again, de dependent on what you're actually doing this ambush for, if it's an intel gathering ambush, you're going to want to do a, a thorough search of everyone. But if it's just kind of a, a harass and destroy you're not going to do a super thorough and super deep search of shit. You're going to grab obviously all the documents and stuff because that's still useful, but you're not going to like start ripping apart vehicles or anything. And then those weapons, all the weapons that are uh, pulled off the objective, you're going to gather them to a central area. PL is going to tell the teams where to gather it, probably in the center of the objective. And if you have time, you're going to document the serial numbers because you can trace where weapons come from. Um, that's kind of important to know in an actual war. So once that kill zone has been cleared and before the search process begins, you're going to dispatch aid and litter teams. So they're going to clear out. And then if there's any friendly KIA or WIA, you're going to go and send that aid and litter team while the search teams are going to work. 
uh, again, friendly wounded are treated first and evacuated, and then enemy, depending on conditions and time. And the PL is going to determine what enemy material is going to be taken off the objective, usually documents. Uh, you're not going to usually just grab all the AKs or whatever other weapon systems and try to haul those through the woods as well. So the rest of them are going to be prepped with explosives by the demo team, um, either using incendiary grenades or double time, double primed timed explosives. So if you don't have access to explosives, there's other means of disabling vehicles and weapons. So taking the bolts out of the weapons, setting them on the on the edge of a tire and kicking them to the barrel till the barrel bends in. Like you got to get creative if you're trying to deny the enemy use of those weapons in the future. If you don't have explosives, obviously. So slashing tires, putting freaking water in the fuel tanks, like you get creative with this stuff again, if you have the time and if that's the intent of the mission is to destroy enemy uh, enemy equipment. All right, so situation we've we've cleared out, we searched in, we've got our all of our weapons getting prepped by demo. In this case, we'll say we won't have any casualties and we killed all the enemy on the objective. So now it's time for our phased and planned withdrawal. So it's going to be done in reverse order that the ambush was in place. So ambush was in place, security, support by fire, assault, and the withdrawal is going to be Assault is going to leave first, support leaves next, and then security is going to be last. So in Ranger School, you're going to use what's called the red, white, and blue. Um, and this is going to be something that you echo around the objective. So red, the PL is going to call red, and all the assault elements are going to bound back across the road or just you know run across the road and get back to the RP. Um, it'll usually be assault one followed by assault two or assault two followed by assault one. So once they're back and once they're clear of the objective, white's going to be next and support by fire is going to withdraw, go back to the release point. And then blue is going to be the last one called and that's when the security teams are going to collapse back to the ORP or the RP, depending on which one is closer. Um, again, this is all very variable. Like you have to figure this stuff out with your platoon or with whatever element that you're uh, working with and you have to kind of understand and know like, hey, if I'm if I'm on security, I'm on far side security, and it's faster to go back to the ORP, I'm going back to the ORP. Um, so the PL, the FO, and the demo team are going to be the last ones off the actual objective. Um, so on that blue, another way to call it is blue burning. So blue burning means that demo is initiated and that time fuse is going and burning down. So another way to do it is to have the security wait until they hear... Um, the explosives go off on the objective if you actually have a demo team. All right, so Assault 1, Assault 2, this is blue. They've got back to the RP, or rather red. Red, white, support by fire is back. And then blue, security return to the RP. Um, and then the far side security here is just going straight back to the ORP. So that ORP security needs to be alert and ready to help count the ambush force into the ORP. So they'll be they'll be they'll hear that explosives go off, um, and then they'll be you know alert and waiting to see the patrol or the platoon coming back into the ORP to count them in. So once the once the platoon sergeant comes back to the ORP, he's going to take over the count um, and get a good handoff with those with the security team. The platoon is going to maintain a hundred percent security posture in the ORP, uh, while a hundred percent accountability on men, weapons, and equipment is conducted. Uh, once they're good on MWE, the platoon is going to pick up and move no less than one major terrain feature or 1K away from the ambush site. And then as required and as you know deemed necessary, the PL and the FO are going to execute indirect fires to cover the platoon's withdrawal, either on the, the last ORP location or on the uh, ambush site. Here's the graphic from the Ranger School Handbook or the Ranger Handbook Correction. This is a linear ambush. We've got our enemy. We've got our templated LOA, assault support, our security. Uh, in this case, they had a rear security team. And yeah, here is a depiction of a squad ambush. So you can see here we've got the actual individual members all laid out here. So we've got our security, security, support. And then we have the rest of the assault line. We have one dude pulling rear security. All right, so that, that's that's about it for deliberate ambush. And now we're just going to talk kind of like extra considerations, um, 
stuff that I've kind of thought about making this as well as extra material from the, uh, I'll say the name of the book at the end. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but, um, anyways, so if you know the direction of travel, um, the enemy's direction of travel, you can try and plan the ambush so that it's on their right flank. The majority of the world's population is right-handed. And, you know, if you're sitting in a truck with your weapon, it's going to be a lot harder to turn to your right if you're right-handed and actually be able to effectively engage. Um, and what that does, is it just gives the ambush a little bit more time on the initial, uh, initial start of the ambush to may achieve fire superiority, an overwhelming volume of fire superiority, and potentially kill these dudes before they even get a chance to get a shot off. Um, other things is, you know, just kind of observing the conflict in Ukraine and just seeing the proliferation of both thermals and drones. Um, with thermals, you might need to start taking into consideration concealing your thermal signature on ambushes um, because you're all going to be sitting there for a while and the enemy probably has some kind of thermal-mounted weapon systems like the, uh, the Crow systems that the U.S. has where it can see thermal um, or just, you know, handheld thermal devices or, or scoped, scope, thermal scopes rather. Um, just kind of, you have to probably expect that the enemy is going to have that and use that to conduct these convoys and these, uh, these, these road patrols. So you should take into consideration concealing your thermal signature if you have the opportunity and the means to. And as well, you know, with the drones, like you got to take into consideration, they can, you know, see pretty well during the day. So you want to conceal and, and really get camouflaged on the ambush line. Every single element needs to be uh, taken into consideration being camouflaged from, from the, from the air. Like just imagine there's a drone over you at all times and take steps to at least try to obscure your actual location physically. So you might not always need to assault through the ambush or the kill zone. Or conduct clearance you know it might just be a harassing kind of ambush where you don't want to assault through you want to get off that ambush location really quick you know you just want to disrupt the enemy for a brief amount of time in order to shape operations for for something else that's going on so if you don't actually need to assault through and then clear it um, you don't need to um, and you don't need to expose your your guys to that risk if you're the the patrol leader or the platoon platoon leader um, that ambush needs to be conducted rapidly uh, with equally as rapid post-assault procedures and withdrawal. You know, you want to try and think of it as almost like a bank robbery, right? You need to have a timer going um, on that objective and be like, all right, we have five minutes from after we, you know, stop the mad minute to assault through the objective, to clear it, and to search. And then we need to bounce because we know that the enemy can call an indirect and or have a quick reaction force in the area that can respond in X amount of minutes. So it might not be five minutes. Might you might have a little bit more time, but you definitely don't want to just be hanging out and uh, and be bopping and chilling after you conduct an ambush, because the enemy is undoubtedly going to converge on the ambush site. Likely they're going to be able to get a radio call off um, before you kill everyone. So just expect that someone's coming. Um, but you should also be able to potentially attack that follow up party either with. Uh, indirect fire or, you know, another ambush, <coughs> excuse me. So a common react to ambush battle drill is to accelerate through the kill zone. Um, so if equipment in the situation permits, you can implement a cratering charge, uh, into your, uh, initiation. If you have the, the means available and you have time to dig into the road without worrying about getting compromised, um, but you can use a creating charge to actually physically stop that lead vehicle or the first vehicle, first or second vehicles, you know. Um, another option is, you know, set up an area ambush. So, you know, a second or third ambush further down the road. And a lot of the times escorts, escort vehicles will stay and fight while the actual convoy accelerates out of the kill zone if they're able to. And then, you know, that second and third ambush will be able to, uh, to mop up the rest of the convoy. Or, you know, if they drive through, you know, area ambushes are very good at, uh, at killing things, <laughs> at killing, uh, killing convoys and just being a pain in the ass to convoys. 
they were used a lot actually in Afghanistan. The Taliban was was pretty effective in in some cases that I've read about of setting up area ambushes, um, just just being pain in the ass. It's like they wouldn't ever get to the point where they could completely neutralize the U.S. convoy, to my knowledge, except for uh, I think that one in two thousand three with Jessica Lynch. Um, there's an example of that where they were able to actually stop the convoy and they took a lot of uh, U.S. prisoners of war um, during the early days of the war in Iraq. But from what I've read and from what I've heard, I don't think that there's ever been a full on, you know, 100 percent massacre of a U.S. convoy in Afghanistan. But they did set up a lot of area ambushes and, you know, just harass the fuck out of us uh, while we were trying to, to drive through certain valleys in Afghanistan. And then it should be common sense, but you don't want to utilize the same ambush site repeatedly because the enemy is going to know. Um, and then, yeah, sources, Ranger Handbook. And then there's that book I was talking about, Special Reconnaissance and Advanced Small Unit Patrolling by Lieutenant Colonel Ed Wolkoff. And he was a uh, SOG guy in Vietnam, and they were operating with, you know, roughly squad plus size elements. Um, so a lot of these techniques are, are well adapted for you know, like 16 to, to 18 dudes or even smaller, you know, like actual traditional squad size. So like 9, 10, 12, 12 dudes. But that does it for Ambush. I'm going to get this edited and uploaded as fast as possible. Let me know if you have any questions down in the comments or let me know if, I, uh, if I'm if i fucked up on anything, any of you experts out there. Um, but yeah, we will see you all next week.